Episode 7. We're on? We are on. All right. Welcome back. Thanks for watching. You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, did you notice we're in a new room right here? We're in the new room. We, we're in the new room. We're still we're, getting it set up. That's right. So the sound may be slightly off, but it sounds okay to me right now. So Yeah, we're, we're getting it. Uh, we're going to get it all set up and hopefully get a little stuff behind us. We got some ideas. Do you have our quote of the day, Jerry? I do have a quote of a day. I kind of stole it from um, uh, Charlie Munger. There, there was, uh, when I read his newsletter, there was a neat, there's several of them. He, I think he's, he's 92, right? I think he's 92 and Buff is 99, if I'm yeah, not mistaken. I, yeah, I, yeah. It's, I, believe, I it was it's shocking. It's shocking. Was but, it, is it off? I don't know. Yeah, I thought it was opposite. Anyway, I think he's yeah, 92. Yeah, yeah. So one of the quotes that just caught my attention was, all I want to know is where I'm going to die, so I'll never go there. And that I would thought, be nice. Huh. <laughs> avoid that spot, and off they go. So yes. that's my quote of the day. And it kind of leads into some of the stuff that we're going to get to anyway. So Definitely. That's great. Let's get into it. CJ Stevens and Jerry Kalitsis work for Investia Financial Services, Inc. All opinions expressed by CJ and Jerry are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Investia Financial Services, Inc. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Clients of Investia Financial Services, Inc. may maintain positions in the investments discussed on this podcast. We're All back. right, we are right. back. We are talking about ChatGPT here. Jerry, what do you know about ChatGPT? You know what? Other than when you mentioned it to me, I've heard about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I read a little bit about it, there's something weird about it to me. AI, AI. Well, I you don't know, know where hey. were they when I was in university? I don't know, but sometimes people are scared of uh, technology. And, well, uh, and what's this fine. is a little bit more than technology, but. It was, uh, yeah, so we, I, I, we, we made this quick little video here and uh, just showing how you can use the program and uh, it's, it's, it's owned by Microsoft, I believe, OpenAI and Microsoft. So you can ask it questions, you can respond back to it, it'll give you, it'll give you answers and it's, it's more than just Google, it will, you can, you can really drill down into it and ask it, it some interesting questions. It formulates a paragraph, it actually exactly. gives you a, a paragraph, almost like a resume type of answer. Yeah, so we had to ask it, what does Philotimo mean? And, and so we've explained it a few times before, but kind of gives you the Greek propaganda answer here. Those are propaganda, like to say. buddy. Those are facts. <laughs> okay. So it's, it, it, is, it's, it's, it seems to be taking the world by storm, and Microsoft, Microsoft, again, owns that, coming out with the latest stuff. Google's trying to compete. NVIDIA's coming out with the AI stuff. And but it's still, it's still getting the data from somewhere. It, it's still getting information from somewhere. Yeah, and ChatGPT, I, I believe it, it's not quite updated with the internet to pull, you know, if you ask, yeah. it, if you ask it who won the Leaf game last night, it, it doesn't pull that information. It, it, I think it only goes up to 2020 or 2021, okay. I believe. Um, but its strength is data. It's, it's picking up data from somewhere and be able to instantaneously give you a response, a paragraph, two paragraphs, an explanation. Exactly. Right? That is, so that that is, is fluent and, and well-written, which is where yeah. the, we've heard... It's funny how things seem to ratchet up and it, it's, it's kind of playing chess almost where um, students now can, you can ask it to write you an essay on Macbeth or an essay on whatever um, the topic is. It'll write the essay for you. And then of course, teachers, the next chess move was determining. So now there's a website where you can actually enter in a student's essay or you can enter in a blog or writing and it will tell you the percentage likelihood that it is written by AI. Versus the student or versus, versus the person. Versus a human, right? And, and it can tell it, so, uh, I've played around with it, it can actually tell with almost certainty whether it was written by AI, AI or not. And then now go to the next chess move where now you can have, well, there's a website now where you can put in the AI writing and it will paraphrase it so that it's undetectable by the, 
this other website that it's so it's just you know like I said the, the chess game goes on so I'm not sure what this means for you realize university come, students and that you, you real, I come from the era where the guy knocked on the door trying to sell his Britannica encyclopedias right <laughs> right up to date encyclopedias yes and you're laughing yeah. but anybody watching this that's over 60 years old is smiling right remember now remember that okay and then university having this kind of stuff available at university to, to say that this is what I want and, and some machine can spit out a finished document is phenomenal. It, it is. And I think it's, I think it also, um, there's a couple of comparisons that I would make and like a calculator, you know, y you can use a calculator to your advantage to help doing things. You can use the internet to, as, a, as an advantage, uh, if you use it the right way to help you learn more things and, right. and take advantage of that way. So, you know, looking at it from the positive side is how can how can companies use this to help automate those repetitive tasks and become more efficient in what they're doing by taking advantage of AI and and to help increase their margins and and use humans to really add value um, with uh, processes. Well, and what and about the negative like side where we don't need anybody to think? All we got to do is ask the question, and it comes up with an answer. What about that part of it? Yeah, and I think that you know, I, I think that the internet scared a lot of people too where we were going to lose all these jobs whereas it actually created so many more jobs so i think that that's the hopeful side of it um and you know chat gpt it is wrong sometimes as well so it you you do get wrong answers there which just like a human you you would you can get wrong answers from right, a human right. and i think you know when we were talking about this the self-driving cars get into an accident but do they get into an accident more or less than a human does? So again, can, can we use that? To, uh, can we take advantage of technology to increase the, uh, the efficiencies of corporations and in, increase the efficiencies well, in our lives? There's a lot of companies spending a lot of money researching this. Obviously, they're... It's the next wave. Is it? Yeah. Remember when blockchain, everybody was adding blockchain to their, their name of their company and then the stock would shoot through the roof just because, you know, some soda pop company in the States was added blockchain to their name. Are those and, the same uh, guys that did the cryptocurrency adding that to their name? I don't know. The NFTs okay, just, and, and just that. But, um, right. So we'll see. Something to, uh, to look out for. It is kind of fun to play around with if you do get in there and, uh, and you can play around with it. So... I think it's worth it to uh, to go in and just have a little it bit is of fun with it. To, I agree. To look at it that way. So, and the next topic we have here is let me reset the timer here. Hopefully, a little more smooth than the last time. Um, Warren Buffett released his uh, annual Berkshire Hathaway annual letter to shareholders, which is always something we enjoy reading. And he's I mean, been he's doing he's this been, for sixty yeah, years. Or yeah. Something, right? Yeah. Okay. And, and you kind of pick so many, he has so much wisdom and experience, you, you can pick those uh, nuggets out of it. So we, we had a couple that we both were looking at and, and agreed on were, were the overarching themes of, of this year's letter. Uh, and the first one was that one or two big winners can make up for a lot of losses. So you don't necessarily need to hit a home run every time uh, yeah. using a baseball analogy you don't need to hit that home run every time if you can pick one or two good companies they can outweigh the losses that are inevitably going to happen when you're uh, when you're in the game as well, long as he is he's good at adding to positions as well so mm -hmm. there, there's the market is inefficient it drops down and you see him adding 50 million shares of coke or some some astronomical number and he's had this thing for 50 years I, I think when i read the newsletter it said uh, the dividends that he's collecting from coke are greater than his initial investment that he did i'm not sure the exact date when he started so i i think his theme he he's trying to explain to people that patience is what ultimately wins um and you're right you don't need you don't need a basket of all winners to win you you just need to make sure you minimize your losses, but you just maintain the positions in. And he's always about and picking good companies instead of a stock picker. Picking good companies has always been his um, his mo over the years. Is picking good companies and the dividends was interesting to me because Berkshire Hathaway doesn't uh, offer a doesn't dividend. Doesn't pay dividends. It doesn't pay a dividend, um, and they're they're more 
they've, they, he's done a lot of share buybacks over the last few years. So just that difference. And I think his, his note in this most recent letter about the share buybacks versus the dividends was if you're buying your shares back at a fair price, it's very beneficial to all shareholders, not just the CEOs, because we see a lot of companies buy back shares, maybe not at the most fair price, but that benefits those CEOs. So if you're buying it back at a fair price, then um, a lot of you know the shareholders are going to get that value. Um, well, the remaining shares are worth more. And it's so worth obviously, it. if, yeah. as long as they're done on fair market value, you're right. So. If you're buying in at overpriced you know yes. numbers, then then it's not as good. And and I think. Um, to, uh, to your point again on, on him buying good companies and finding that value is being in and when you're in the game long enough, I guess, you know, you, you, you got to be the right place at the right time, which I think was another point that he made in he's that letter. He's the major Apple shareholder too now, is he not? Yeah, I think he's, he's one of the largest. It's, right. his, it's the largest holding um, okay. for him, I believe, at my last look at that. And you got to be in the right place at the right time. We all would have you know, been lucky enough to have money on the sidelines and invest in 2009 um, at the lows of the market or 2020 in the COVID lows uh, to be able to put more money to work there. Um, so, you know, being able to be in the right place at the right time, having some money available, which he's been able to take advantage of that, stay in there long term and yeah, obviously I've said, been I think successful. I've said, it, I've said it on a previous one. I, I, I'm not sure what year it was. We, it had to be over 10 years ago. We went to Omaha for one of those conferences and these two old guys are sitting at a table, mm -hmm. drinking Diet Coke, mm -hmm. and yeah, having drinking a break. Well, having he, drinks, a break, he drinks the full. He drinks having a break to go outside to get a Dairy Queen ice cream because mm -hmm. they were major shareholders of Dairy Queen, and then I forgot the underwear company. Was that, it Hanes? No, it wasn't no, it Hanes. wasn't Hanes. It's not Hanes. Yeah, there was another one that they mm -hmm. said Fruit of the Loom. Fruit of the Loom. Fruit of the Loom. Yeah, that you could buy. Loom. They had they had skids <laughs> and skids stand. of underwear at a dollar, but you could only yeah. use an American Express card to buy them. Like it was. It was all, and all money donated to charity. So mm -hmm. good for them. Lots of people have they have a loyal following, and his newsletter. I will tell everyone if you get a chance. It's kind of long. It, it runs a few pages, but it is a very interesting read. You're not going to read about earnings and details. You're going to read general of how they think. Well, he also said, so, and if you follow us on Instagram, you saw our quote of the week was was from Warren uh, from yes. Warren Buffett uh, and his most recent letter here, and just about um, having a couple of winners. The flowers will outgrow the weeds. Um, yes, o I do. over that term, and and he did say, you know, as he does, he seems to have a good sense of humor as well. It also helps to live well into your nineties um, to 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 uh, funny, grow your wealth. It's funny <laughs> you say that. You seem to forget one other point that Charlie said. One of the key statistics is hooking up with a good partner who's a few years older than you. Do yes. you remember that saying? Uh, yeah, I do remember he okay, said that. Good. Yeah, you know, good. I wasn't sure it completely applied in no, this yeah, situation. No, I wasn't sure if you, if you read it or not, but that's fine. <laughs> we'll move on from that. That's a go. very interesting so, point. Okay. On to our next topic here, which uh, of course is a is a is a major topic that everybody. Um, you know, including us major and our theme. clients, major theme, you know, what, and, and in Canada overall, you know, housing is, is a huge aspect. And so, you know, do we have a crystal ball? Uh, is your crystal ball, um, clear Jerry on where the housing market's going? Mine's a bit foggy, but mine's been clear for a long time. Yours has just, been clear. For, okay. It's right, just yeah. that the unpredictability <laughs> of interest rates, which you've assured me are going to come down. If you call for rain every day for a couple of years, eventually it it's going to rain. It um, will rain. Broken clocks, right? Twice, uh, twice, a, twice a day. Is that the saying? Um, so one of the, one of the, we had, we had a few more charts here that we wanted to share and, and go through for this. Um, if you've got a mortgage or you're considering to make a major purchase, you can be confident that interest rates will be low for a long time. That was um, your buddy Tiff, the governor of the Bank of Canada, on July 15th, 2020. Well, you like to say my buddy's Jerome Powell, so uh, okay. I'll give you Tiff. Um, and, and, I, and I'll argue with you, at the moment he made that quote in July of 20, uh, I think it was 2020. I'm, mm -hmm. I know. Uh, July 2020, yeah. We were coming out of COVID. At, at and the still, time, I mean, COVID data, was still going the on. The data that he had showed that's what was going to happen and i think that's the you know the reason we bring up this is not to uh say that he was wrong or, or right or, or whatnot um you know obviously time tells but the the point of bringing this up i think was more so to say hey you know these central bankers 
they don't know the future. Their crystal balls no. are foggy as well. So when you're making these decisions to, to take on a mortgage or to make a major purchase, it's important to weigh the pros and cons and to take a look, talk with a professional about you know, what are the potentials that other could variables. happen, the other, other variables, variables that could happen, and so that you understand the level of risk that you're taking. Because, of course, now we've seen a lot of Canadians listen to TIFF took on a mortgage, made a major purchase, and now their payments have gone through the roof here. So, um, you know, you, you want to be able to, not that anyone can predict the future, that's not what we're saying, but you want to be able to weigh those uh, risks that, uh, and other variables, like Jerry said, like you said. Um, well, I, I just like the fact that put in a couple of variables, the what if this happens to me. And so that you um, think about it. You just, all. you have that cross your mind. I don't want and you it think, to happen hey, to you. Know? you. I don't want rates to double. I don't want you to lose your job. But I just want to say, if that were to happen, yeah, what happens to your payment schedule, etc. So yeah, so so that's the, and and then you know looking at hey where where are mortgage rates going to go, we're looking at here the purple line is conventional mortgage lending rates, the five year rates in Canada over the last few years, and the the orange line is the five year benchmark bond yield in Canada. So what we see here is they tend to track along the same trajectory. So in, in January, towards the end of last year, we did see bond yields come down. You see that orange line coming down, uh, and that would have made us hopeful that we see a, a bit of a turnaround in the a reduction in those five-year lending rates. And we saw a plateau there instead of that increase. So we did plateau with the bond yields, but we've seen bond yields creep back up over the last but couple of weeks here. It didn't come down. It didn't come down. Right. It, you know, it did plateau. And, and you know, yeah. when, you're, when you're looking at it, you kind of see the bond yields have plateaued as well. So, you know, what, what, one of the things that we're looking at that we like to share with clients is we're keeping an eye on this here because we would, we would think that you're going to see bond yields coming down before you see those mortgage rates coming down there as well. So something that we're keeping an eye on. One thing that we wanted to mention as well was this was a pretty staggering number. Shocking is the correct word. Shocking. And when, when you think about it, uh, you and I were talking about this. 35-year um, amortizations for residential mortgages, well, we didn't even think were possible in don't Canada. Even, don't even go there. Just, just use your chart of, of yeah, so last you, quarter of 2021. Yeah, so if you look at the far right column there, Q4 2021, you see... 45% of residential mortgages had a remaining amortization of 20 to 25 years, and 27% had a remaining amortization of 25 to 30 years. So three quarters, three quarters of the mortgages. Which means if at your current payment, at your current rate, it would take you 25 to 30 years, yep. whatever that number would be for you specifically. 27% of those would be to pay off your mortgage completely. 27% were in the 25 to 30 range. Not applicable was over 30 years didn't and exist. over 35 years didn't exist. This is Q4 2021, one year ago, 15 months ago, right? One year, not 10. Q4 one. 2022, you see, and I, and I really want to highlight the 30 to 35 years here is 44%, sorry, 30 to 35 years, 4%, 35 years and more, 26% of residential mortgages at CIBC as of Q4 2022 have a remaining amortization of 35 years or more, which means, again, it's going to take you 35 years or more at your current payment, at the current rate, uh, to completely pay off your mortgage, um, So, I, I, which is just a staggering number to me. I don't know what to say other than I'm sure that the bank is not showing this chart to, uh, well, and how, how did this happen? Because, you know, if you well, go into the bank, you can't get a 35. You can't go, hey, no. you know, I'd like a 35-year amortization. They just don't do it. But with the variable rates changing so quickly, um, it forced, and the it changed rating. the amortizations on people's mortgages uh, very quickly as well. And now we see some the numbers on trigger rates being hit and things moving around like that. Another stat I had that I, I didn't with include here was if your mortgage rate is 6%, and you have a 30-year amortization, you're paying 140% interest to the bank over that 30 years. So that means that if you have $100,000 of debt, it's costing you $140,000 to the bank 
of interest. Of interest. So you're paying two hundred and forty thousand dollars down to pay off that hundred thousand um, dollars, which you know, if we look at average houses in Toronto GTA being a million, just to use easy numbers, you're paying two point four million dollars. So you're paying more than double to pay off that house, um, which again is uh, the. the like Jerry, like you've said in the past, the numbers just don't make sense here. No, they those don't make interest sense. rates and the value of and, those homes. I don't want to get into the specifics of why we have such a low delinquency, very low bank rate. Oh, don't worry. There's such a small fraction of people foreclose on their homes. The reason is you walk in there, the bank pushes this in front of you. It buys you another year, two years. But eventually, like you like to say, you're, you're pushing it down the road. Well, eventually, mm-hmm. there's no more road. So this is well this when is a, when these people have to you know when these Canadians have to go and uh, renew their mortgage you you can't have a thirty five year amortization yes. you know you some banks are given thirty years but you know you, you have to increase your payment to get it down to thirty year amortization so and we don't know what the rate's going to be when you do that either so so that was a bit of a shocking number that uh, you know you you don't like to see that um, on there. Uh, this was another great chart. I know we're going over on the time here, but this is a big topic. So um, we're, this was another great chart. So we're looking at a map of Canada uh, here. And you see the blue line there is the Canada-U.S. border. And you see a red line there in the tiny little um, southeast corner of like Canada. It looks like a triangle. And you see that triangle there. So that's the Quebec City to Windsor Corridor, they call it. Um, and it, it, it does give it away there, but... What? When you told it to me the first time, mm-hmm. I didn't see that, and you asked me. Yeah. So, so go, the, ahead, go the, ahead and go through that. So what, what, what the question is here is the percentage of the population of Canada, all of Canada, what is the percentage of the population of Canada that lives south of that red line there in Canada? Right. So I, the way I did it without knowing the answer before you told me, mm-hmm. I just said, oh, I don't know, Canada has 40 million people. And I know, I know we have, you know, 50% of the people, 60% in Ontario, Quebec, in this area of the, of the country. But that little triangle, you know, I, I don't know, I would have said... Uh, Five million people. I don't know. Ten million people. Well, when when you look 20%. at the triangle, I mean, I I didn't do it, but you know, the percentage of area that that triangle takes up oh is is even less two percent of Canada. You know, so it's fifty yeah, percent. And, and some of you might have seen it on the bottom already, but fifty percent of Canadians live south of that red line there, which is alarming. To I mean, that's no. that. It's not alarming. It's it's uh, mind blowing to me. No, I still you saying it again. I still have a difficult time. And so the you know that. one of the main factors of that is that the um, that corridor is, is just a very, there are a lot of a lot of bigger popular cities through that corridor. Of course, Guelph is in that corridor as well, and that's that's where the action is, right? That's where the action is. I mean, you go to Vancouver, they they have that downtown core, and and they have. Of course, their housing prices have been going up as well, um, but in that corridor, 50%. So now we go on the housing again, and we go, okay, the demand um, for housing in that corridor, having 50% of Canadians living there, th- how can you get enough housing? How can you build enough houses can't, can't do it. in that corridor to house 50% of Canadians? You know, So with technology, work from home, you know, we, we've seen the numbers of... Ontario people from Ontario moving out east uh, moving out to Alberta um, we, we've still that that corridor is so you know houses in that in that corridor in my opinion it, it's I, it's hard to think of that demand dropping down there or the supply increasing enough that we're gonna see a you know a deeper substantial decrease in the price and again that you know in my opinion just when you look at the the population here well I see I, I see the word Regina, I see Winnipeg, and as a previous podcast that we, we came back having driven to Victoria and yeah. back, there is like all kinds of room over there. So well, the, exactly. these numbers yeah. don't work. They don't work no matter what we say, it doesn't work. And you do have the, you know, my geography is, uh, as, as you know, as, as to steal There's a lot line of from you, I, you, I, I, do, I do forget a lot of my geography Canadian lessons shield. there, but the Canadian shield. 
you know, it's, it rocks and there's not enough soil to really have, uh, right, but you know, right, I mean, right, yeah. but again, this was a, a pretty interesting chart that, uh, that we found that, um, was there. And so, so that, that was it for housing. So again, no prediction on where housing is going, but just a few things that we're looking at and a few interesting things that we came across there that supply, um, is, uh, how we're going to manage that moving forward, especially being in, you know, and most of our clients in that uh, Windsor to uh, Quebec City corridor there, 50% of Canadians there, um, you know, how are they going to manage that uh, supply and demand? So I think that'll be interesting to see. Time will tell. And so now we had an update on the economy. Um, so we wanted to talk about a couple of things here. One of the charts that we have shown in previous episodes of the podcast, let's see if I get this timer going here. You think if I just keep hitting the there button, it'll work. Boom. Yeah, so uh, one of the charts that we've shown in the past where I think in a previous podcast, we were showing that we, so this was the two year treasury rate uh, down in the States and the target uh, federal funds rate uh, down in the States as well. So we've shown this chart in the past and, and what this chart is basically saying is we, when we see that orange line cross through the blue line, we normally get a pause in the central banks raising rates. Um, and now, so we did see that cross happen, but of course, you know, coming into February there, we've seen the two year rate bounce back up to where it's at 4.9% new highs over the last five years at 4.9%. So we need to get that federal funds rate above that line there and holding. Um, I think before we're going to see a pause in central banks increasing rates. So, you know, as you've been saying, we're still going to get a couple of increases here. Uh, well, your man, Jerome, if my man is the TIFF guy, if yeah. your man is the Jerome take guy, I'll J-PAL, yeah. J-PAL, it sounds like the rates are not coming down. All the data coming out is pointing, to, or the market is pricing it in or whatever. Yeah, the, you know, is. the market's kind of pricing in 5%. We're at 4.75% on the central, on the Fed funds rate in area right now as the target and, you know, 5%, 5 and a quarter five percent, 5.5%, and and some people like you are saying. And so, you know, what are we going to see here? I think who knows, but I do think that when I'm looking at this chart, I do think that we are certainly in store for another couple of increases, which usually trickles over into Canada as well. A couple of increases there but too. So. Our guy said that he's going to pause. Yes. I think his numbers come out next week or, or some, the new data comes out next week. Yeah. And, um, and these guys are so data dependent. Um, I, you know, I read an interesting thing too that says, you know, can you remember the headlines from, can you remember the headline news from, uh, you know, we might be able to remember from March 2020, April 2020, because that was COVID and of course a, a major um, event. A, to use a, yeah, to use a, a bit of jargon once in, here. A once in a lifetime It's event. a black swan event. Everyone yes. likes to talk about black swan events. Well, hey, yeah. if you were talking about it, that's in the dictionary, COVID pandemic definitely a black swan event. So that was a unique time. But if I was to ask you, do you remember the headlines from July, 2021 even, or June, 2022, you don't really remember those headlines. So again, to zoom out a little bit here, keeping in mind the clients and long-term investment, having a plan is zooming out and thinking, you know, month to month, week to week headlines don't seem, don't tend to matter in the long run. Um, overall, there tend to be just a bit more noise. But when you're in the moment, it is so hard to, to zoom out there. No, there's, there's no question. It's difficult and mm -hmm. it's scary. And, and you think the world is coming to an end. Um, but I, I think the data that is coming out, especially with inflation, you know, we, it's, in the, it's almost on the front page every day. Mm -hmm. And you can argue it back and forth and you can have great debates of, Oh, we're finally flatlining and we're controlling. Oh, it's still getting out of hand. Oh, it's going down. But but the reality is, it's still there, mm -hmm. and they're having a tough time. Especially on the food side of the equation, I think food and shelter that everyone uses. The gas one, it, well, you know, uh, I, 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 like, like the energy one is is a weird one because mm -hmm. history, fifty years ago. It was oil that controlled it. Eventually, it came down. Inflation yeah. got wiped out, and off we went again. Now there's so much variables involving oil and where it's coming from, who's supplying, where we're getting it. 
it just doesn't feel we're out of the woods yet. I, so I, I think that one when, when you're speaking with a client recently and just talking about all this inflation stuff and and you know net, right now you're talking about food and shelter, right? But necessity a year, item, a year ago, a year ago when inflation was going up, okay. you, everyone was saying, oh, oh, the price of lumber is going through the roof, right? And it was lumber. It wasn't food. It was lumber. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't lumber because lumber prices have come down. It was aluminum. Gas. It, was it was aluminum. Gas. Well, it was gas at the pumps. And everyone said, oh, the gas at the pumps, gas at the pumps. And, and now we've seen that number come down, even with carbon taxes being added on to there. And so, you know, one of my, back to my previous point of the headline noise that comes through all the time here is it was used, it was lumber, it was used cars, it was gas, it was, you know, the price of oil, it was shipping costs and shipping containers, which we've talked about. And, and now it's food and shelter. What we've seen all those other things come down in a, in a dramatic fashion over the last year, which does you know, provide some hope that, you know, inflation is going to come down and check, especially the supply chain stuff. But it's, it's more of what's the latest thing that we're going to look at. And don't we look at a basket of all these things when, when we're talking about inflation? And if we're looking at the basket, of course, food and shelter do make up a you've large portion. You've explained to me about but, core inflation. You've explained to me specifics about inflation, what's mm -hmm. excluded, what's included. Food is included in every single person's Food's included calculation. as well, but food is okay. affected. Food is so. affected by the price of uh, shipping, shipping, you know, shipping containers, shipping costs. Do you feel food has gone down? No, I'm saying it's affected by those things. It is. Things. I agree with you. It's also affected by the price of oil the, because those, that's in the shipping as those well. Those containers were 17. We talked about it. 17,000 a container in, in the peak of COVID, and now they're under 2,000. Those, I get it. Those costs go into... The, the price. price of food. So now those costs have come down, which so how again... Come, how come bananas haven't come down? Which again would, would lead me to believe... Well, if you want to pick a certain specific item... Well, you're, you're it's, forcing my hand. Well, no, because there's certain things... You know, if you want avocados from California, okay. then there's a cold wave in, in California right, right now. Pick a head of lettuce. That's going I don't know. To, what item would you like to use? No, but you're picking all the ones that have gone up. Eggs. No, no, eggs, no, have gone, eggs have gone up no, too. I didn't, and I didn't come pick down. bananas. I just use bananas because it's just don't an item. Don't start raising understand. your voice here, okay? Um, you know, so we can pick those certain items that, that this lead to the headline. This is a good time that you can apologize now. That lead that to the... miscalculated. That lead to the headlines okay. that it, it is going up. And of course, we all know when you go to the grocery store, things are expensive. But... What I'm saying is that as we, we thought, we saw gas prices went up and they came down. We saw the price of lumber come up and they came down. So, you know, I do think that as some of these supply issues ease and some of the, you know, gas prices hopefully, have, they have come down. Who knows if they'll go back up again. And, and obviously you have the, the war in Ukraine still going on that is affecting uh, the price of food and, and the price of these things. So as those things hopefully sort themselves out sooner rather than later and the war in ukraine obviously for more important reasons wow. but the these we're going to see the food come down and then inflation coming down from there uh again so i don't like to quote numbers with you because you're always going to look it up and tell me the number <laughs> don't worry i'll but, add this in our editor will add I'll, this into it after i'll round it off to i think it was 11.4 percent food is more expensive than it was last year at this time so yes there's noise i agree with you 100 percent and it was all different variables of why it was up. Mm -hmm. But the reality is it's still up. Loblaws is in the front page of the news as Prouse gouging and everyone's complaining and, yeah, and every, everyone's got their own reason. For mm -hmm. But the bottom line is the average Canadian is paying a lot more for food and it's yes. a necessity item. Mm -hmm. You have two little girls. It's a necessity item. Right? Yeah, you know, and, and okay, we, that's you know, all the, I'm saying. I'm not the, 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 your bill keeps, keeps going up. And, and when we're talking with clients, it's, it's everybody. Is and, everybody and so, going to buy a two by four at Home Depot? No, they're not. But everybody's putting gas right? in their car yes. and then now the gas is a bit less, you know? So, so again, hopefully I, I'm agreeing with you that the food inflation is there, but hopefully that's coming down with some of these things getting back in check a little bit, but uh, it, it is certainly interesting times here. Um, so to, uh, to move on to our last topic here, um, maybe before we even get into, um, a few recommendations that we had, uh, RSP season just finished. Um, so we had a successful, um, RSP season. A lot of clients were 
adding money, uh, you know, maybe closer to the deadline. So what we're not maybe a lot of did it closer to the deadline. Let's so what we want to do is when we're talking with those clients and, and if you're watching uh, right now and uh, you, you have an RSP, then, you know, let's talk about putting a plan in place before we get to uh, the end of February and that deadline. Let's start, you know, either increasing your contributions. If you make regular contributions right now, increase them to put yourself in a bit of a better position to not you, have to come up with that. You don't have the sum. pressure of the end of February of next year. And if you, if you don't do regular contributions, something to consider is to take advantage of uh, dollar cost averaging um, and getting that money invested on a monthly basis. And again, easing that burden of the inevitable uh, lump sum contribution that uh, the, you, you might usually make. Uh, I know this is not scripted. I think people understand this is like live, <laughs> non-scripted. But is yeah. this? I see the time, it says four minutes. Mm -hmm. Can you, I'll let you do it. Can you just give a quick little 30-second blurb on that CPP calculation that came out that anybody that sits in front of us and we have that oh, conversation about C taking your CVP at 60, well, mm -hmm. just quickly say those numbers. It was, it was 86% of people take their CPP before Eight, 86 or 95 before 65. It was, so the stat was that 95% of Canadians have claimed their CPP benefits at age 65 or earlier. 95, okay. 95% yep. of the Canadians um, take and claim most... their CPP benefits at age 65 or earlier. And in the last decade, most Canadians have claimed their CPP at age 60. And this is happening despite despite the financial incentives that are offered by delaying the start date, um, which again... It depends on a number of factors. There's no yes, one does. size no, no, fits know. all here, but I think it's. Um, I think we're hopeful that more Canadians, and certainly our clients, we're having these conversations all the time. But hopefully, that more Canadians and more people that are obviously linked to us um, and, and chatting with us have the opportunity to to have, have that chat, discussion have talk, and, have, and have that exactly. discussion because. As we said earlier, with making a major purchase or you know the mortgage, what we were saying there is, let's talk about the pros and cons. Let's talk about the upsides and the downside of it, and so that you can make a more informed decision. Because it is easy to say, hey, why not take the money now? It means more money in my pocket. It must be good. Um, and and it just it, well, it's not it's often to the as case. Free. There. You almost think that it's free. It's not free. It's your mm -hmm. money. You, yes. You've worked for this money. So exactly. Anyway, I, so it, it is something that, uh, you know, we, we might do a video on more specifically on uh, CPP and a few of the pros and cons just to put that out there uh, in the future. So uh, I just, keep an I eye just out for that. It was kind of neat when, when we read that, especially that only less than 1% of the people wait till age 70 to take it, even though yeah. the inflation numbers went up and they increased it, they indexed it higher. Yep. So anyway, it's just a conversation. Something that, again, the encouragement here and the real takeaway here is to, before you sign that paper and you go ahead and take it, let's have a conversation first. And, about uh, your specific and situation. And give us a chance to have a conversation with you about the upsides and the downsides because, you know, for, for some people, it, it might it's worth delaying. Some people, you know, maybe not depending on other factors, but it is yeah. certainly worth a conversation. Yeah. So, um so that that's good. And uh, the last thing, a little more informal here, um, I am excited to watch the uh, F1 race for the season starts. And of course, I uh, jumped on the F1 bandwagon here from watching the for Netflix that Drive to Survive series. So I, I got hooked on it after watching a couple seasons of that. And so the new season of Drive to Survive just came out. So if you've seen it before, you know, check it out. If it, I think it was good again. And this was the first season that I am watching of the the Netflix show um, and the that, live races that I actually had watched the live races most of them last year or I followed along a little bit more last year with it so it was kind of interesting to you know you, you, you know what happened a little bit but you get a better glimpse into the behind the scenes aspect which I think they do such a great job on there of uh, doing so the first race is uh, this weekend is Ma that the first race of the season first race of the season yeah okay Max Verstappen see what happens all right. And uh, I, I did see that series too, and it is interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a car guy, so I found it very interesting. But I wanted to have a quick shout out to um, the Ginny and Georgia, Ginny Georgia, and Georgia. Yep. series that still is in the top 10 of Netflix. And mm -hmm. of course, we, we have a connection have a to one yeah. of our clients' uh, daughters, who's one of the key people in that series, and, mm -hmm. and Nicola and 
she does an absolute great job and i think it's it's a great series to watch actually it's highly highly entertaining um to watch i i would recommend that i think a lot of people have seen it but if you haven't definitely put it on your radar yeah it is it is super interesting to see somebody that you know and and she, like, you, like you said she did such a great job um in, well, you and, know and renewed it's, it's, for two seasons um and uh, and one of the more popular shows uh, on Netflix and it's it's it does a good job of showing the parent aspect of it and then the child aspect of it and or the teenage aspect of it I guess and then bringing in the parent when they were a teenager as well right it's, so it's, uh, it's well made. so so it is it is interesting to uh, to see that to go back and see the parents when they were teenagers and of course having two kids you always say no I was a I was great and I never did anything wrong. Um, and, and, uh, of course, if you had a show you made about you, uh, you might find some interesting, uh, you things can't that even say that without smiling. That there you, you go. Did anything yeah. Wrong. But so anyway. yeah, the show, the show was interesting and, uh, yeah, and the only thing I'll to say check is out. The, the last thing I'll say is what I'm currently watching is, is, uh, uh, I think it's called manifest. Okay. Which is <laughs> it, shockingly, just in, in one sentence, a plane left Jamaica, don't quote these years, in 2014, mm -hmm. I don't know, three hour flight, whatever it is, it comes back. Well, the plane arrives five and a half years later. All the people on the plane are now in an area of five and a half years. They don't know what happened to this thing. So that's, it is well made. I haven't seen all of it. Mm -hmm. And it's a little shocking. So it's another one that is very, very interesting if you want to see something like that. Nice. Without giving anything away. Nice, so. yeah. So, uh, so that's uh, that's it. Well, the last thing I'll just did you see our? I think that's the GP guy, isn't we it? We do. So I, so the editor threw in a little bit of a, an AI background for for I the show here. So that was, was that was for the AI uh, aspect of the episode here. Um, so thanks very much for watching and tuning in, and we will chat with you soon. Tax season is upcoming, so look forward to seeing a lot of you over um, tax season over the next month or two, and hopefully sooner rather than later. And remember, don't blame me for the taxes, okay? <laughs> we only prepare them. Yes. We, we're yep. not the people that make the rules. We, we enter the numbers there. The, the, so. We enter the numbers. I like it. Data entry. There exactly. you go. There you go. So All right. thanks for tuning in. Thanks we'll again. see you next time. C.J. Stevens and Jerry Kalitsis work for Investia Financial Services, Inc. All opinions expressed by C.J. and Jerry are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Investia Financial Services, Inc. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Clients of Investia Financial Services, Inc. may maintain positions in the investments discussed on this podcast. Mutual funds and or exchange traded funds are offered through Investia Financial Services, Inc. Insurance products and services are offered through PPI Management, Inc. and through multiple insurance companies. PPI Management, Inc. is an independent and separate company from Investia Financial Services, Inc.